Chicago, Illinois, sees violence as a disease that needs to be cured. And we're now joined by a guest who believes he has the medicine. In Chicago, Illinois, Dr. Gary Slutkin, founder of the newly named Cure Violence Program. He's an epidemiologist at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And Dr. Slutkin, we're glad to have you on the air from the Windy City, as they say. Perhaps you could start by telling us how you developed this notion that this is a disease that requires cure. That's a new way of looking at it. Well, in, in part this derives from my own background. I'm a physician and I'm trained in controlling infectious diseases. And most of my career I've been working on problems like tuberculosis and cholera and AIDS. Um, when I came to, back to this country from abroad, I began to look at the curves and the maps and they look just like infectious disease curves with waves upon waves and the maps showing clusters. And the more that we began to really investigate the problem, the more that we saw that one violent event led to another violent event, led to another, just like the way flu leads to flu and TB leads to TB. So it spreads um, like other infectious diseases. And over the years, we've been trying uh, various methods to interrupt the spread and therefore um, be able to drop the shootings and killings. And it seems that the methods that we've been using have been effective even as um, documented and validated by external independent studies. Even the Justice Department and the CDC have validated that the methods that we use for interrupting spread, for changing norms, for dropping the shootings and killings in a neighborhood um, work. They are effective. They're predictably effective at making a neighborhood safer. I'm guessing, though, that when you went to political decision makers and said, I'd like to take a new approach to the way we fight violence, and here's what I'm thinking. Uh, how many of them scratched their heads and said, we're not sure that this is the right way to think about this? Well, you're accurate that there is a, a standard way of thinking about this problem, which is um, highly moralistic and, frankly, stuck. And, um, but this isn't the only problem that historically has been stuck. I mean, we, had, we were stuck in how to manage malaria or even plague um, for decades or centuries before we understood what was really going on underneath it. But you're right, there, there's still a common way of viewing this problem, and it'll probably take a while. Um, but I must tell you also, you know, the Institute of Medicine just did a workshop that we were involved with that is also validating this approach, the way of thinking about this as a disease process the way of thinking about this as a contagious disease process, as well as thinking about how to interrupt it and shift it. And it, it is really good news because it, we have new tools for um, dropping violence and making a neighborhood safer now with the use of interrupters and behavior change agents and, and with this whole new approach. Follow up on that if you would, because we need to understand more about the model for violence prevention yeah. that you're now advancing. Well, there's really three levels of uh, work. One is that you need to first detect a potential event and interrupt it from occurring. I mean, if this were SARS you need, or bird flu, you need to find first cases and prevent the transmission. And so in the case of shootings, we have to find out from within the neighborhood who is likely to do a shooting next, who's angry about a girlfriend or about money or um, some disrespect, and we hire workers who have the confidentiality, like other kinds of health workers, to find out what's going on in the neighborhood. And then they're highly trained in being able to not only detect these issues, but also by being able to persuade, buy time, distract, change the subject, reframe, help people see that's in their interest not to do it. And then we need to keep working with those people, just like the way we work with TB patients, who we've immediately helped get non-infectious, but then they need something a little more for the longer term. And that's what the behavior change agents or the outreach workers do. Interrupters doing the first part, the behavior change agents doing the second part. Let me jump in there, because I think I'm, I'm curious yeah. about these interrupters. Who, who are the yeah. interrupters? What's their experience, their well, background? The, well, the interrupters are people who are selected from the same, in a way, community. They, they're selected for their credibility, for their trust, for their access, for being able to be 
understood and to be able to get right in there. I mean, similarly, when we worked in um, AIDS, we used sex workers to reach sex workers. In TB, we were, used refugees to reach refugees. So we use people who, um, who have changed their thinking but are, actually have the same Rolodex to be able to interact. And then they become trained as these kinds of health workers. So they are current or former gangbangers, if I can use that term? Well, certainly not current and um, not in every case former. But if they come from the same neighborhood and have similar backgrounds, some of them, of course, many of them, in fact, did have uh, backgrounds. But that's what allows them to have the access and the trust and the credibility because a large part of the mind is devoted to saying, who is this that's talking to me? Is he talking to me in my interest? Is he someone I already know? And that's, you know, a lot of the whole cure violence approach is about not only preventing the spread, but using science, using brain science. And the brain science tells us that you need people from the same group to be able to have the trust, have the confidentiality, talk to you in your own language, and persuade you. Of course, the training is also highly essential. But to use your example earlier about, say, SARS or AIDS, nipping the yeah. virus in the bud early on, why wouldn't right. taking the worst, most egregious offenders from a particular neighborhood and locking them up behind bars, thereby getting them away from the rest of the neighborhood, and thereby preventing the spread, why wouldn't that do the job just as well? Well, it's because the norm hasn't been changed. I mean, this actually is not what you said, of course, is, has been tried. Um, it's not as if, you know, law enforcement societies, government haven't tried to, there is, it's not as if there aren't enough people already who have been put in prison. Obviously, this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, the reason is because the norm is larger than the individuals. So what, what's required is preventing the actual spread, changing the thinking of the highest risk, and then shifting the thinking of the whole group, the way we've shifted thinking about smoking or drunk driving and so on. So you can, take, you can catch a few people, but their, their place is taken by others who, have, who are also following the same set of behaviors. Because that's how behaviors are formed. They're actually, people are following and copying and modeling and wanting to belong to those who are doing it. So you can't, the kinetics of the, the situation are such that removing some people doesn't make it better. And frequently it makes things a lot worse because <coughs> what happens is um, more younger people get involved taking the space of some of the older people who were caught and then you have even more chaos, more violence going on. And this kind of breaking up into smaller cliques, you know, is frequently the um, non-intended consequence of these arrests and imprisonments. Okay, so in our last minute, help me with this then. You, you've explained that you've got empirical evidence that the old way of doing things doesn't work. Do you have empirical evidence that your new approach, in fact, does work? Yeah, well, there's just so much evidence on this now, and it's not just from our own data. I mean, there have been uh, multi-year, multi-method, um, long-term studies. The Department of Justice did one with seven years of study, 10 years baseline, four methods. The CDC and the Johns Hopkins University did another one in Baltimore on the 30 to 50 percent drops in shootings and killings. In the Baltimore studies, in the Justice Department studies, 40 to 70 percent drops in shootings and killings, 100 percent reductions in uh, retaliation murders, hot spots getting cooler, all kinds of uh, data on this now. And even in uh, some of the newer uh, cities that have been using this, we're starting to see 90 days, 100 days in one place, two years without a shooting in, in uh, places that are um, beginning to work with this method. Hmm. Fascinating new approach. Dr. Gary Slutkin, University of Illinois, the founder of Cure Violence. Good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.